Hello everybody. Welcome to our first uh, video lecture of this term uh, in uh, COUN 6613, Family Systemic Therapy. Um, and as you can see, uh, I've been kind of uh, making some artwork on my board here. Um, we'll get into all that in just a second. This video is going to cover and build upon your, your reading at this point, going to cover the theoretical foundations for uh, family therapy um, and really uh, sort of pre present the argument for uh, really considering most, if not all, counseling from a systemic uh, perspective. We're going to cover a couple of different uh, inter-influencing systems as they uh, pertain to the rationale for family therapy, um, and I'm setting it up this way because I like to think of uh, being a family therapist, it's kind of like being a, a family engineer, okay? So as, just like an engineer would do, um, we are, uh, as family therapists, going to be um, steeped in understanding uh, the systems that are at play uh, in influencing um, sort of human development and uh, sort of what affects human suffering, what affects uh, human well-being, uh, the promotion of well-being, as well as the relief of that suffering. Um, and we as engineers, sort of family engineers, understand uh, this, this wide range of systems, uh, how they work together and mutually influence each other. Uh, so that we can be uh, sort of prepared to recognize where there are flaws in the system that family is using to um, really kind of feel and deal with uh, the challenges of everyday life um, and accomplish your developmental tasks uh, and to uh, not just survive but to thrive in the environment within which they live. Um, and so um, that's sort of the uh, foundational sort of metaphor that I will bring to you in this course. Um, so without further ado, let's get into why family therapy or a systemic perspective in the first place. Well, as I mentioned in the introductory video, um, we are going to draw heavily upon, uh, among other things, sort of your previous learning uh, regarding uh, human development. So you are likely to remember from your previous learning in uh, human development that typically um, earth, earthbound uh, animals are born in various states of um, Altricialness and precocialness. Now, um, precocial is probably a word you may have heard of, even if you haven't uh, had uh, extensive training, previous training in human development. We think of young children who are perhaps presenting as uh, socially or educationally advanced as being precocious, right? That uh, is alluding to this sort of more base, basic um, understanding of the term. Um, so precocial references um, a, an animal uh, in developmental science that is uh, born with advanced development. So for example, um, a, uh, a baby foal, a horse, a baby horse, is considered to be pretty precocial because it's got the neurological development to be able to get up on its uh, feet and walk around within a matter of hours after birth, okay? So, of course, that's precocial, so altricial is sort of the opposite end of that developmental spectrum. So, um, human beings uh, happen to be uh, at birth, one of the most altricial 
um, in terms of development among animal species and, and particularly um, among mammals. So when uh, we human beings and other primates, but primarily human beings are born, we are extraordinarily dependent upon um, our caregivers, uh, the, the bigger people um, in our environment. Uh, usually this means the bigger people that are responsible for our conception, uh, gestation, and delivery. Um, we, when we're born, um, have very little hair to may help us maintain our body warmth. Uh, we are unable to uh, uh, move ourselves uh, from one place to the other, uh, as in we can't walk, we can't crawl, we can't really use our muscles very well. Uh, we don't have very well developed vision, so it's very hard for us to see. Um, and so we need um, additional assistance with all of these things to just survive really the first hours of um, sort of postpartum life. Um, so because of that, we are uh, essentially uh, really advanced pack animals. We are social creatures, right? Um, and as we uh, work through uh, our own uh, development and our uh, sort of goals to meet our basic needs, we are highly dependent upon our big people. Now, remember, our basic needs have probably been most famously articulated by Abraham Maslow in, Abraham, in the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Um, as we go through these, keep in mind that these are not uh, necessarily linear uh, in nature in their achievement. They are sort of mutually uh, occurring um, and sometimes mutually influencing. But remember that um, at the very base of the hierarchy uh, are our physiological needs. So this is our need for air, shelter, uh, warmth, food, those types of things. Um, so. We need physiological needs to be met. Next up on the hierarchy are our safety needs. So we need to know and have a, uh, a reliable sense that when we are um, in, uh, presented with some type of danger, uh, that we will have a reasonable expectation that we will get through it um, and that we are protected, we are safe. Um, this has a neurological uh, influence in that uh, it allows our threat sensors in our brain, as you might remember from uh, previous coursework, um, we're talking about the limbic system here, uh, the relationship between the amygdala, uh, hippocampus, thalamus, and hypothalamus as they relate to assessing uh, threat to ourselves and putting into action mechanisms that uh, are self-protective. Um, when we have a reasonable expectation that our safety needs are being met, especially at the very beginning of life, uh, the amygdala and other threat-related parts of our brain are allowed to um, sort of take a back seat in deference to the development of other parts of our brain, particularly the prefrontal cortex, which is our most human part. So, physiological needs met, safety needs met, then we are... Um, able to focus on our need for love and belonging. So, human beings, as we mentioned, are quintessentially social because we are so dependent upon um, others, other human beings, um, for uh, getting our basic needs met at the very beginning of life. Um, and so, uh, Within this state of the hierarchy, we as human beings need to feel as though we belong to a group, um, that we are welcome in that group, uh, and that we can make a um, meaningful contribution and impact uh, on that group. And that, uh, that sense of belonging is also conflated with a sense of love. That sense of, that sense of love is really kind of at, at its most sort of um, unemotional um, and unromantic sense. Uh, just the, uh, the sense that we have that we um, are wanted, welcome, and uh, needed 
within a specific group of people, um, and we'll get into kind of the, uh, the different levels of those uh, social systems here in just a moment. Um, of course, as you might have guessed, uh, the family is the primary social system within which we uh, ideally will experience our sense of, and get our needs for love and belonging met. Um, just above um, love and belonging are our uh, esteem needs. So this is our sense of um, our basic value, um, our self-esteem, our sense of respect, um, that people appreciate us, want us around, um, and see us as um, yeah, meaningful contributors to uh, the environment, to their lives and the lives of others around us. Um, so it's closely related to love and belonging. Our sense of belonging can, can fuel our sense of um, our own self-respect, uh, self-esteem, and our self-appreciation. And that leads to our um, pursuit and accomplishment of sort of the ultimate goal of each human being, which is self-actualization. This idea that uh, we are uh, developing into, becoming, and living as our best selves, meeting our um, various levels of potential, um, and as uh, uh, we accomplish these things, they, they circle back through uh, and mutually influence up and down uh, the hierarchy. So, keeping in mind that, that all human beings are working on meeting each of these uh, levels of, of need, both uh, individually and collectively, I want to introduce to you, uh, or just briefly review, uh, what has been termed the attachment behavioral system. So um, you may remember that uh, uh, there was a psychoanalyst um, who broke uh, from a little bit from Freudian tradition um, in the uh, early to middle bit middle part of the 20th century. This uh, psychoanalyst's name was John Bowlby. He was a um, psychoanalyst practicing um, in England. Um, and he was the first to sort of theorize about um, sort of the patterns of human attachment. And so his theory was that when, a, when human beings are born, they get on what is essentially a, a circle, a circle of security, all right? So... Um, the little person is born and then gets on top of the circle, and on the top of the circle, human beings are exploring their environment, exploring the world, uh, learning about it, um, learning about how they uh, fit into it, how they influence it. Uh, on that uh, explorative journey, something is likely to happen uh, to alert the little person to their own need for help. Um, and when this happens, the, the uh, little person um, moves to being on the bottom of the circle, and they head back to the big person, um, who is serving first as a secure base to support the exploration, and then as a safe haven uh, for the little person's return. Uh, the job of the big person is to welcome uh, the return of the little person, and then assist with helping the little person feel safe, feel soothed, and then to make sense of their experience. Okay, So, when a young person is coming back to the big person, the big person's job is to assist with safety, soothing, and sense-making. Okay, um, This is kind of a evidenced or, or at least displayed, if you've ever been to a, you know, a, a public park, a playground, and you see a, you know, three-year-old uh, running around playing, uh, they are exploring the world, but then they might fall and, I don't know, bump their knee or whatever. That is the alert to a need for help. Coming back to the big person, they, they run back, the big person, in an ideal sense, will sort of 
welcome the return pick up perhaps the three-year-old um, this has this the function of providing safety assistance with soothing and then you might hear the big person narrate for the little person what they witness happen if they see it right um, and they, they also might ask what happened and the, the in some level uh, a three-year-old might be able to say I fell and hurt my knee and, and then the big person might be able to say something like oh that uh, that must have hurt so bad. I can see the mark on your knee where it uh, and it hurts badly when we fall and skin our knee. Um, and also provide maybe some guidance about you know what do we do about it. Communicating to the little person that I've seen this before. I'm not afraid of it. I know what to do about this. Uh, and then supporting uh, the little person when uh, they get their safety, soothing, and sense making needs met. And then get back on top of the circle, and the big person's job is to uh, kind of follow the child's lead and get back on to supporting their exploration again. Um, it's fascinating, if you watch closely, um, you might even notice that um, a child in this scenario will be wrapped up in the parent's arms and then might do a little wiggle, and then that's a signal to the big person that it's time to get back down and go back on and explore the world. Um, one attachment uh, expert that I uh, was at a seminar was, was teaching about this very thing, kind of alluded to it as the child getting their attachment batteries charged, and they kind of do a little wiggle and almost like the, your, maybe your iPhone buzzing uh, when it's fully charged. All that to say, it's sort of an implicit alert to get back on top of the circle. Anyway, it's very fascinating, and uh, if you want to get really nerdy about it, um, you can see it in action. So that is the attachment behavioral system, okay? Now, as you might imagine, because human beings are so altricial, um, this circle is happening really tight and really fast at the very beginning of a infant's life, okay? Because uh, they will need, they will be constantly alerted to need, whether it be need for warmth, uh, the need for food, uh, the need for soothing, and so um, oftentimes they will have the, the signal for being on the bottom of the circle is sort of a cry of some sort, and it is the uh, big person's job to um, not in this case welcome the return, but maybe go to uh, the small person with these assistance, um, these assistance types of things, um, and at any rate, this goes really really fast very beginning and then over time it slows down there's a little bit of distance that's created between the little person and the big person um, this sort of is evident in like when children go to school they might uh, fold in other sort of uh, attachment uh, attachment figures okay big people who can sort of intervene and do these jobs in the absence of the primary uh, attachment figure or figures, um, even to the point of, um, you know, as we reach adulthood, partnering up, um, and over time, uh, still, even though there's this attachment system is happening at a slower pace with much more distance, some of you may live a far, uh, Far piece. You may you may live far away from uh, from your parents, uh, your attachment figures at this point in your life. But I would be willing to bet that um, most of you um, still call home uh, on a semi regular basis. Right? We're just checking in. Um, we might want to consult about something that we're dealing with as an adult that our parents or other attachment figures are likely to have some type of experience with. Um, and so, yeah, uh, this attachment behavioral system does not end in childhood. In fact, it persists into adulthood. Um, so, um, you may remember from previous uh, education about this that when this circle goes well, um, what develops are securely attached children. Okay? who then can progress into adulthood as secure or autonomous 
adults. Okay. Now, one of the things that's really important to, to make clear here is that um, security um, is not really related so much to uh, emotional and behavioral regulation, as some people might have assumed. It is really related to um, emotional and behavioral flexibility. Okay, so typically secure children can be open, flexible, and kind uh, in most places with most people um, uh, and in uh, most sort of circumstances. But they do have developmentally appropriate emotional responses to uh, whatever circumstance they're experiencing. Um, the, tr the, the key determinant of a securely attached child is do they respond in a way that you might expect to the three S's here? Do they respond to a sense of having safety? Do they feel, can they, can they be soothed by the parent or the attachment figure? And can they work collaboratively um, with the attachment figure to make sense of what's going on uh, in their environment and in their experience? Um, when this doesn't go well, okay, uh, I, should, I should mention that most people, I think the estimates in the 60 percentage range, um, are securely attached. Okay, most people are securely attached. And um, again, as we've learned since the mid-90s, uh, our attachment patterns from childhood persist into adulthood. Um, sometimes, when this doesn't go well, uh, young people get stuck on the bottom of the circle in the far uh, end of the circle. Um, these are children who have assessed that their big people are reliably unavailable uh, for safety, soothing, and or uh, sense-making, but usually all three. These are children who have an attachment pattern that has been termed for avoidant attachment patterns. You also may get um, children who are stuck on the bottom of the circle that are stuck on the close end of the circle. Um, the, this pattern has been termed um, anxious or resistant. Um, sometimes you might hear it called ambivalent. Okay? Um, these are children who have assessed that the big person is unpredictably available to assist with safety, soothing, and sense making. Um, and so what ends up happening are behavioral and emotional patterns that essentially serve to control the proximity of the big person. So um, while uh, avoidant, avoidantly attached children are likely to demonstrate sort of flat affect and a low level of responsiveness during times of, of sort of need, um, children with a uh, anxious, resistant uh, attachment style are likely to have big emotion, um, and they are um, unlikely to, or are, are resistant to, soothing when, even when the attack, the, the big person, the attachment figure is providing things that would demonstrate uh, sort of a ability to provide safety, soothing, and sense making. Um, what, one thing that is, I think is important about avoided children is to know that these children are often missed because they are not necessarily disruptive. Um, they are not expressive emotionally, and so people assume that they're okay. Uh, when, um, and they might assume that they're securely attached, when in fact um, uh, they are not. If you were to... Um, uh, connect a heart rate monitor to a securely attached child and an avoidantly attached child and then have them go through um, sort of a stressful experience. I'm not suggesting that you do this, but if you were to, to, if you were to go about this process, you would, you would see outwardly that the securely attached child is having a, a expected emotional response to the, the stress, uh, both an expression and in automatic or autonomic responses within the, within the body. Uh, but the avoidantly attached child would likely not have the same 
um, expression. Uh, they might seem indifferent or they might seem unaffected by the stress, but internally their autonomic and somatic factors um, would be um, responding similarly to the securely attached child. So keep that in mind for those of you who are going to be working uh, with children that the securely attached child does have emotional responses, but they are emotionally flexible. You be flexible in response to safety, soothing, sense making, avoidant children um, have assessed that their big people are uh, not going to be available so that sometimes they don't even know that they need assistance. They may not even uh, recognize that they uh, could benefit or to go to a, uh, a big person for help. And the um, anxious resistant child is likely to have big emotion that is difficult and, and, and they are found to be difficult to soothe um, because they have assessed that their big person is um, unpredictably available so they have to enact um, oftentimes either angry or helpless types of behavioral patterns to control the proximity of the big person. Now there is a fourth category uh, that happens in uh, very rare cases, but they are vastly overrepresented in populations affected uh, by poverty, uh, severe mental illness of the adults in the home, uh, or and or incarceration, have an adult that's uh, incarcerated in the home. And these are children that um, uh, demonstrate what are called disorganized attachment patterns. Uh, these patterns develop when um, uh, a child assesses that their big person is uh, both uh, sort of a requirement for, for having their needs met and is either terrifying to the child or terrified by the child. Uh, these, uh, I think it's important to note, it, it, it's possible for a, um, uh, a parent to be terrified by the job of parenting and that is picked up by the child um, and um, it sort of scrambles the neurological wires that are related to this attachment pattern. And the child assesses that, um, you know, I need to go to this person, but I know that they're either going to hurt me or not be able to help me. I am just kind of um, in, in, a, in a tight spot. Again, these patterns um, develop and they often will show up as things like reactive attachment disorder or disengaged um, or excuse me, disinhibited social engagement disorder. Um, they are very severe, very rare, but overrepresented in uh, impoverished, in, incarcerated, or uh, mental illness affected populations. Um, so, this is the system in which uh, people feel safe, soothe, and this sense making piece here, okay is sort of the domain under which um, the sort of, we'll get into this in deeper, greater detail in the next video, but cy the cybernetic factors of a family, that sort of the behavioral and relational and emotional patterns that support the family's functioning as the family um, sort of works toward achieving individual and collective developmental goals minimizing suffering, promoting well-being to the best of their ability. The sense-making is kind of where the um, descriptions of how the world works, uh, what are the rules, what are the roles in the family, uh, and what are the relationships, relationships within the family, and how do they, how does each person sort of, uh, how is each person expected to function within those? Um, how are, what roles do different generations play in the functioning of the family? We'll get to that again in a little bit. Um, and other sort of patterns that develop that either um, sort of support or um, um, inhibit development. Um, each of these sort of cybernetic factors typically are, would be considered um, an attempt to solve a problem of some sort. Um, and uh, that sort of is the foundation for this idea that uh, all problems within a family start out as solutions to other problems. 
they just seem to they, they come to a point point where they outlive their usefulness and begin to have sort of a not not just a a point of diminishing returns, but a point of uh, inhibition or a point of causing suffering uh, within the family. And that's usually when the client lands um, at your service. So, ideally, parents can be available to be uh, the secure base and safe haven with a reasonable level of reliability. Um, Good enough really is good enough, as you may have heard. Uh, parents who are, or attachment figures who are supporting uh, and developing secure attachment with their little people are making mistakes uh, at a rate of two to three times a minute. Okay, so perfection is not required, uh, but reliability, uh, openness, kindness, flexibility between supporting exploration and welcoming the return of the safe haven are the key ingredients. Um, Another key ingredient is, uh, do adults have their own sort of coherent narrative about their own development, their own life history, uh, their own patterns of relating? Um, can they describe these things with sort of a beginning, middle, and end? Uh, can they describe them succinctly, accurately, and, and in ways that provide evidence for their um, sort of their perceptions and ideas. Um, and it's also important to note that, um, as I said before, attachment patterns develop in childhood. In fact, a lot of what goes into developing an overall attachment pattern um, is accomplished within the first year of an infant's life. So these are pre-verbal, um, neurological wired, neurologically wired patterns, okay? Uh, that are changeable, but that are um, sort of implicit in nature for the first several years of a child's life. Um, so these persist into adulthood. Uh, secure, securely attached children uh, become uh, autonomous adults. Avoidantly attached children become what are termed dismissive adults. Um, and uh, anxious, resistant children become preoccupied adults. Um, and of course, disorganized, um, disorganizedly attached children um, become uh, unresolved adults. Right. Um, remarkably, if you can understand an adult uh, caregiver's attachment patterns, you can predict the child's attachment pattern at a 75% success rate. That is astronomical when it comes to um, sort of predictive assessments and analysis in um, human psychology. Um, so keep that in mind about the power of the attachment behavioral system and the power of your understanding of how that uh, how the system functions within a family that you're working with. Now, it's also important to note that. Um, a big person can be doing the best that is possible under their circumstances and sort of insecure, avoidant, or anxious resistant patterns can still develop. Um, that is, I think, a nice segue into our next uh, sort of presentation of systemic influences. This is um, Yuri Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems model. So, as I said before, we're also kind of getting into the history of the field a little bit too, right? So, this system was proposed by um, John Bowlby, who uh, had essentially um, a what, what became his protege. Uh, you may have heard the name Mary Ainsworth. Uh, Mary Ainsworth was uh, a human development researcher and uh, professor uh, who did most of her uh, academic, uh, I guess, research and teaching at Johns Hopkins University uh, in Baltimore, but then later retired and uh, was a professor emerita at the University of Virginia. 
there are two um, sort of attachment assessment and treatment clinics in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, that are run by two of Mary Ainsworth's protégés. Uh, so Ainsworth took Bowlby's theory and um, created uh, what is called now the Strange Situation Assessment uh, Instrument um, and tested it across uh, populations in different uh, areas of the world, different cultures, um, and demonstrated that this is sort of a common, dare I say, universal uh, human uh, phenomenon. Um, now, Ainsworth and Bronfenbrenner were contemporaries, okay, and they were also uh, uh, developmentalists. Um, and Bronfenbrenner said, you know, uh, this is this is really really nice. This makes a lot of sense. My worry uh, is that it doesn't go far enough. Okay, so this um, sort of assesses the interaction and its consequences between child and attachment figure usually a parent, but not necessarily. And Bronfer better propose that there are actually other systems of influence beyond the parent-child relationship that are also uh, very vital for uh, sort of understanding the factors affecting a child and a family's development. So, as you can see here, I'm gonna pull up some notes here briefly. Bear with me. My computer has gone to sleep on me off the screen. So, here we have in the center, and, and you'll see, and I'll post a, um, an image of this on Blackboard, you'll see concentric circles, okay? This is my sort of rudimentary attempt to uh, demonstrate that. So, at the center you have the child, okay? And the first concentric circle outside of the child is the microsystem, okay? In this microsystem are uh, influences like family, um, school, peer relationships, uh, neighborhood environments like the playground, um, religious organizations, health services, and perhaps if the child is uh, involved in sort of a preschool or daycare uh, environment. These are all social experiences that will have an effect on uh, the child's development, both physical, emotional, and relational. Um, and uh, can influence um, how this circle operates as well. So, um, moving beyond uh, the microsystem is the mesosystem. We'll, get to that. we'll skip over that just briefly and get to the exosystem, okay? And then the macrosystem. So, the exosystem is essentially extended family and neighbors, uh, the school board, the influences, decisions that are made at the uh, school, local school level, other governmental agencies that might affect healthcare access, uh, daycare access, um, other sort of broad social services, uh, sort of governance and administration. Um, it also includes the parent's economic situation, so whether or not uh, certain things can be provided that are essential and then beyond essential uh, for a child. And then also the mass media also uh, as part of the exosystem that communicates messages uh, to uh, the family and the child that may influence uh, their um, sort of self-understanding. Now, that's the exosystem. Uh, the mesosystem is essentially the uh, means by which the exosystem uh, influences the microsystem, which then influences the child and sort of uh, how the exosystem gets to the child, how the microsystem might influence the exosystem. Essentially, this is, this is the system by which these things pass through. So, uh, for example, uh, an element of the mesosystem might be television or the internet. Um, the mass media delivers messages through these media and it arrives at the family and or the child in a way that influences the way in which sense is made and sort of their experience of, the, of their environment is organized, the organization of the world, okay? Um, beyond the exosystem is the, what is called the macro system. This is sort of the attitudes and ideologies of the culture in which the child lives. And 
On the outer rim is what is called the chronosystem, which, is, which are the environmental changes that occur over the life course of the child. Uh, these are all things that can influence, again, how the world is organized, how people make sense of the world, what, what they come to expect when it comes to um, relating to themselves and others, other human beings and other uh, factors um, in the environment. So, let's say, for example, um, we are working with a family that um, has one parent. Um, that parent uh, has to work multiple jobs to um, address economic concerns, right? Um, those two jobs may have a primary effect on the big person's physiological needs, such as just basic fatigue, right? Um, and so it also may influence uh, sort of safety, right? Because the parent may have to work overnight. Um, they may have to work even during the day while the child is at school um, and may not be available to leave work to come pick up the child in the event that there's some type of, uh, of need. Maybe there'll be an, an illness or maybe something, God forbid, happens at school that, that the parents need to come pick up the children. And so there are all kinds of things in the ecological system that can influence the big person's availability to uh, assist with safety, soothing, and sense-making, okay? And so what really matters here, interestingly, too, is the child's assessment of the big person's availability, okay? And it's important to note that um, for many obvious reasons, for example, not having a life experience uh, and not being able to kind of, because we're so altruistic, like not being able to know um, all of the variables that are at play uh, in any given situation. Children who are excellent at observing what's going on around them, they have to, they have to be able to have some uh, sort of individual capability to maintain their safety. Um, children are excellent observers of what's going on around them, but they're not, they're not good at interpreting what's going on around them. They require the assistance of a bigger, more experienced, um, safe person to create their coherent narrative about what's going on in this moment, what does it mean about the world around them. So, that explains... Um, why is such an important factor for us to um, have an understanding about how the numerous, almost infinite variables within this system can affect this system and this system in real time, right? Not only that, but also recognize that, as we mentioned before, attachment patterns persist from childhood to adulthood, right? That alludes to um, the likelihood that relational patterns will be passed down through from generation to generation, right? And so there are untold numbers of factors that can influence um, a parent or an attachment figure's availability to support uh, their child, to support their other attachment-related um, sort of relationships such as with the older generation, with a partner of, of some sort, um, with um, the different systems like the school system um, or the healthcare system. There are any number of variables that impact uh, the functioning of these different systems and how they um, specifically show up in your clients' lives. Um, so it's essential uh, that we understand sort of the ecological situation, um, the physiological and other uh, basic needs situation, and the relational history of each member of the family with, with whom we are with which we are working, 
so that we can be more likely to accurately assess where are the flaws in the system and what we might offer in terms of um, addressing those flaws to support the family's ability to solve their problems in a way that minimizes suffering and promotes well-being, okay? Um, again, most, if not all, problems in a family start out as solutions to other problems, right? The parent who has to work overnight um, is solving a basic physiological need problem for uh, herself or himself, themselves, and uh, their children. Um, it also may leave them vulnerable to other needs not being met, such as safety or love and belonging. Um, the child may begin to question, you know, do I belong here? What does it mean for my own uh, sense of esteem? Am I, am I valuable to this, to this group? Um, so, at the risk of uh, oversimplifying things, not necessarily going into great, deep enough or great enough depth, um, I'm going to leave it here. But it's very important for us all to be taking into account just a, a recognition that human beings begin uh, as very altricial uh, animals. We require great assistance when it comes to um, getting our basic needs met uh, from the very beginnings of our lives. We require and we develop uh, patterns to support our interconnection with others, both inside our own family and in the environment at large. Okay? And these systems mutually influence each other um, in ways that we as family therapists need to be accounting for. Um, understanding in compassionate ways um, and um, looking for sort of what is the basic need that the family is trying to meet and can we help them strategize and implement new strategies and new ways of relating that are more likely to um, support uh, well-being through um, supported growth and development and while also minimizing uh, suffering as much as possible. Um, so, all that to say, systemic perspective is important, and um, we will come up in our next video about cybernetics, returning to the sense-making elements of the attachment behavioral system um, as it relates to the ways in which patterns of relating and patterns of understanding the world are likely to develop, to develop, what are the most common sort of uh, patterns that we might see as family therapists, and what do we do about them? Um, how do we assess them? Um, these are all things that uh, we'll, we will cover in our next video. Uh, I look forward to uh, uh, responding to and learning about your questions, comments, concerns uh, on the discussion board. Um, thanks, we'll see you at uh, the next video.